And now, Wolf Bites Open Mic. The Bass Jackers. I just came home actually from tour. Hey guys, this is Phoenix Paul. Hey, what's up? This is Sean Frank. Wolf Bites DJs and your favorite artists. Sophie Francis. Sophie, thanks for joining us today. Hi, it's super nice to join you guys. What's up, guys? This is Ahmed Van Buren. Now, Open Mic. Hey, Wolfpack, how's it going? Chris Lehman back with another edition of our Open Mic podcast. Today, I'm joined by Ulf Ekberg of the Swedish group Ace of Bass. Ulf, really appreciate you joining me. How's it going for you? It's uh, very unusual times everywhere oh, in the yeah. world, that's for sure. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And that's, that's actually where I wanted to start here. Because um, you're, um, you're in Stockholm, is that right? Yes, I'm in Stockholm. Yes, in Sweden. So, so what's uh, what's Sweden like right now? Because I, I know they took like a little bit of a different approach than everyone else when it came to coronavirus. Yeah. So, um, uh, we've been the punch bag of a lot of my uh, newspapers around the world mm-hmm. because we did a different route. Um, I think it's a lot of politics why we became a punch a punch bag. Uh, if you look at every country in Europe and uh, can probably include America there as well. Um, nobody have really listened to the authorities and their recommendations. Yeah. Uh, recommendations in Europe, except for Italy, because Italy just came from nowhere and they had mm. no other choice than just do a complete lockdown until they understood what was going on and getting the equipment and so forth. But the rest of Europe had time to prepare. Mm. And authorities in the rest of Europe did not recommend a total lockdown. Because that is also um, creating a lot of other problems, yep. in, including depression, uh, bankruptcies, recession, etc., 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 etc. We were the only country who actually had authorities deciding what to do, not politicians. Mm-hmm. Politicians were listening to the authorities, uh, and that's why we had a completely different strategy than almost every other country in the, in the world. Our strategy uh, were based on we might have to live with the coronavirus for the next three years or more. Mm-hmm. We have to find a sustainable way of living with the virus, which means if you're closing down a whole society, that's not sustainable. We all know that. Yep. And we have seen also the result when now everybody's tried to open up, the problem comes back. And actually, even worse, people are depressed, people have lost their jobs, and all the other negative things. Mm -hmm. So I'm very proud we took a different approach, and we haven't really um, changed our approach just because everybody thought we did the wrong thing. Mm -hmm. Uh, Of course, everybody has been debating internally here, is like, why are we doing completely different thing from everybody else with so many experts around the world? But um, uh, if you look at, I mean, we were, uh, we were very unlucky in the beginning because we have, um, uh, we have spring break in February and there's different cities have spring break in different times. Mm-hmm. Stockholm is the biggest city, two and a half million people. Um, we had spring break and everybody goes skiing then. Um, and everybody loves skiing in Italy. Okay, so mm-hmm. Stockholm were basically in Italy and actually in Austria as well, which a lot of the sickness came from, viruses came from too, uh, at that time when it just exploded and nobody mm-hmm. knew it had exploded. So when we came home to Stockholm, that's when everything happened in Italy. But we were already there when it happened, but people yeah. didn't know they had the virus, correct? Mm-hmm. So suddenly we had it everywhere. We had it in Stockholm and a lot of people had it in Stockholm. And we were not really prepared for the virus. We had no, we had very little knowledge about the virus. We didn't know it was asymptomatic, um, which we, we thought it actually is only could uh, were carried with symptoms, mm-hmm. and yeah. it could also spread with symptoms. And um, uh, one very big mistake that we did uh, is always easy to have ideas in hindsight correct yeah. but uh, and know what to do and not to do but it was uh that we got the, the people that were cleaning their their elder homes mm-hmm. did not have protection gear oh. so it took a little bit for for us to understand they should also have equipment mm-hmm. we didn't have equipment in sweden because we haven't been in a war for 240 years 
So we basically have burned all the equipment we have because we never, it just costs money to have them laying around, mm -hmm. uh, which I think was a completely idiotic idea to burn it because a lot of things we burned we could have used yeah. <laughs> for, for yeah. this crisis. It is kind of having a war, correct? Even though yes. it's invincible mm -hmm. uh, uh, enemy. So um, uh, we didn't have the equipment and it took a while for us to get the equipment. And then we had a system in Sweden which was, is not really prepared to um, procure uh, for these enormous amount of materials. Um, so each municipality, they had to do their own, own procurement and they never done, not even bought a match from China before. Mm -hmm. So having these completely inexperienced people working with these smaller municipalities, uh, starting to buy things from China was a, really a recipe for disaster mm -hmm. because they were competing with countries like Germany and Italy and Spain and France, which is the country we're buying. And our, we, our, our system is different. But mm -hmm. so obviously now we're looking over and try learning from these mistakes. So we couldn't get any equipment. And the first equipment we, we got was they were all fake. Um, mm -hmm. Because there was a huge, I mean, a huge problem with fake masks and fake yep, gloves, and fake that. everything. Yeah. Um, worse is fake respirators who exploded and burned and killed people in England and in Romania and so forth. Uh, we didn't have that because we had a lot of. We didn't have to buy a respirator. We, our our hospitals were very good, but we we were missing a lot of equipment. So. I think uh, that uh, uh, created uh, some interesting articles that we had the highest death threat per million people in the world for a couple of weeks, uh, which was is a little bit unfair because it was because it reached the elderly homes and when mm -hmm. people are ninety years old and get COVID, they do die, yeah. uh, and uh, it was very unfortunate. Now we have stabilized everything. We have no uh, COVID cases in any other homes anymore. Uh, and basically very few on EVA. Uh, and uh, I think in average, it's like a couple of people dying now. So it's, we, we, have we have it under control. Mm -hmm. uh, another interesting thing is that people still saying that only 7.5% of Swedes um, had uh, Corona. The thing is in Stockholm, uh, there's also something called T-cells, which you can't measure. Uh, for uh, for um, 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 for antibodies, you can't measure it in the blood. It's only very special uh, laboratories that can do it. But T cells, apparently, forty percent of people have T cells that you have got from other flus, which mm -hmm. actually protects you uh, uh, from COVID. And also, if you have COVID, the body can produce T cells to fight the COVID. But you can't see that in result in the blood. Mm -hmm. So. You can go around and think that you you didn't get it, but you actually had, you got it. And most yep. people have no symptoms, correct? So uh, we think Stockholm basically have reached herd immunity, even though I read today in CNN that we haven't reached herd immunity. So it's so many yeah. bad facts out there. So I don't know what to start, but I think we actually did a great job. However, it's not over yet. So let's see when it's over. Yeah. Uh, if it's ever going to be over, who had the right or wrong? Yeah. But I'm I'm proud that we did our own thing, and people are, I mean, everything is open, the site is open, uh, schools are open, gyms are open. It's just nightclubs who are closed, but mm -hmm. I don't really miss it. Uh, some some young people miss it, but they do their own parties at home. So <laughs> otherwise, it's it's been it's been it's been pretty good compared to I was traveling around Europe in Italy, in Spain, France, uh, and Greece uh, this summer. And it's it's a very very different Europe uh, than than the past uh, you know thirty years I've been traveling there and I know my friends in the US have have told me a lot about the, you know California and Florida and, and New York it's it's a, it's, a it's, it's a disaster of course it's horrible and and I'm really suffering with the people. Yeah, well, I, I can kind of hear it in in your answer there too, and I was impressed when I saw you have a, a degree in, from Harvard Business School. Um, where when did you have time to do that? <laughs> Well, I had to take time uh, in the break between all my other businesses. So Ace of Base, um, we did basically two comebacks. We, well, well, there was one comeback with a little break in between. And, uh, and after I was done with that, I decided to uh, go back to school 
and uh, do something with with the knowledge I got through being an entrepreneur for many years. It's the basis, of course, my first company I created, but I've done a lot of companies the past 30 years. And I wanted to, uh, because I didn't really finish school, I started to do music instead. And I, uh, I knew what I wanted to learn more about. Um, and I uh, went to Harvard, I also went to MIT, to, um, to, to more um, realize how to maximize the knowledge I already have. And of course, mm-hmm. learn more, meet more people. And very interesting to, to go to an American school or to American schools. Uh, compared to the Swedish system, it's it's very different. It's I think it's much more efficient. And, and, I, and I, how was it? I hope, um, a little bit the way you study and the way you do live live um, cases uh, more than we do. We much more theory in in Sweden, uh, and uh, and so it's it's a, it's a, it's a little bit more efficient. And of course, the the teachers are. Uh, on, on a very high level. I mean, mm-hmm. the professors are, I mean, you, you read the CVs, it takes you two hours to read, to read what they've done in the lives. It's, uh, it's fascinating. And also the people that go to these classes are very interesting people as well. So you learn a lot from them too, uh, working in groups and so forth. Uh, but it was great for me because I, I now I can organize my knowledge a little bit better uh, than I could before. And uh, I, I use it also in my investments I do now. I do a lot of impact investments uh, and helping a lot of uh, family offices doing the same. So uh, try to do my, 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 my little thing to make this world a little better place. Yeah, so I, I, you've mentioned you, you do a lot of different things right now. How much is Ace of Base still a part of your life? How much do you still do stuff for, for Ace of Base? So I'm um, because I'm now the manager. Guys, it started that I was the manager. Then when we um, uh, two years into the success, we released our first single in the U.S. Uh, with uh, Arista Records with a with a gentleman called uh, Clive Davis. And the first thing he said to me, "Ulf, you, you realize you can't be the manager, correct? Because I'm going to complain a lot uh, on you as a band, and I can't." talk to you about yourself. So you had to get the manager. And I didn't really realize was the, what a manager was because we were doing everything ourselves. So we had a tour manager with us and, uh, and that was the title, tour manager, manager. So I asked him, do you want to be a manager? Of course I want to be a manager. Okay, here, here's your manager, talk to him. And then we ended up to have a manager, but he was not the best manager. Um, uh, and in the end, we fired him, and then I had to go back and be the manager again. So I basically running, been running the business for for the band, and um, I do spend about two hours per day on on different projects. We do education for different schools uh, in Europe, a little bit in the U.S. and Africa. We do a lot of remix the contests. We do a lot of collaborations with other bands. Uh, try to um, help out wherever we can. And uh, there's a lot of syncs, uh, a lot of films, movies, uh, TV series with the music. Um, interesting enough, a lot of TikTok. Uh, I, I think I saw it was like 400,000 videos or something on design or something on TikTok. Mm-hmm. It's quite, <laughs> quite a lot, I, th- I think. Uh, yeah. And I can actually see in my revenues that mm-hmm. I make more money from TikTok than from Spotify, funny enough. Wow. Um, which is a little bit sad to see that you're going to ban TikTok now in the U.S., but hopefully some are going to buy it before it gets banned. Yeah, that'll be interesting to see how, yeah. uh, how that turns out. And in there, in there, you talked a little bit about the, the earlier part uh, of the career for Ace of Base, and I wanted to talk about when you joined uh, with them initially. It sounded kind of like a, a hectic story. Um, it was actually 30 years ago this month. Um, and there, I believe there was a, a former member of the band who decided to go to a Rolling Stones concert that night. Um, uh, it, all, almost true. It's, um, I had the band with Jonas and Jonas had another band and they had another band member in that band. But we were performing the same night as Rolling Stones performed. Uh, on, we have uh, in Gothenburg we have something called The Avenue. So it sounds very weird in America saying The Avenue because you always have a lot of avenues <laughs> in every city, but we have one avenue. And uh, um, the Rolling Stones concert was um, a bit outside Sweden 
And when we performed, um, all the people from the Rolling Stones concert came to Stockholm, uh, sorry, to Gothenburg, to, to the avenue, where we pro were performing with both bands. And uh, one of the guys in, in Jonas' band, he got a state fright. So he, he couldn't handle all the people. So he, they asked me to, 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 to jump in instead. Uh, at the time, we were called uh, Technoir. Mm -hmm. That band was called Technoir, and then uh, we decided basically to merge our two bands into one, and that became uh, Ace of Base. Yeah, and that it really seemed like it was a, a grind for you guys for the first couple of years. Um, is I think you kind of went to the, I guess you'd call it the mainland of Europe, um, and and we're looking for a label, and it, it took a while to to find somebody who liked your sound. Yes, uh, we were working uh, literally. 24 sevens for four years, Jonas and I. We, uh, we actually put blinders on our windows in our studio so we couldn't see if it was day or night. Wow. And uh, we, uh, uh, we worked until we passed out, drinking extremely uh, bad tasting coffee. There was no Red Bulls at that time. <laughs> um, and uh, and uh, basically just worked 24-7 to get, get uh, a demo tape ready. We started to send it out to, to record companies in Sweden. Uh, there was no record companies in Gothenburg. It's the second biggest city in, in Sweden, almost a million people. So it's still a small city. But all the record companies, I think at that time we had like about 50 record companies in, Sweden, in Stockholm. Um, and then, of course, everything was considered, and now it's not so many uh, left. Um, but uh, we sent all the tapes to all these record companies. No answer, no answer, no answer. Send it again, no answer, no answer, no answer. Send it again. Then we got one letter back from EMI saying, please send no more tapes. And they sent all the three tapes back to us. <laughs> so then we decided that, you know what? They obviously don't understand our music. We have to go up and play it for them. Uh, so we had no money. So we had to hitchhike to Stockholm. And it's kind of, it's, um, uh, it's like a five hour car drive to between Gotham and Stockholm. We had no car and we had no money for, for train tickets either. So we were hitchhiking with, with, with trucks and sometimes it could take us two days to get to Stockholm. And of course we knew nobody in Stockholm so we had to sleep on benches in parks and, and so forth, uh, quite interesting. Uh, and then we were knocking on the doors and all the directing companies, da 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 da. And, um, and uh, we said, we're not leaving until you listen to our demo. And, uh, and in the end, they like, okay, we, we had to get rid of these crazy Gothenburg guys. So <laughs> let's just give them 20 minutes to play that damn <laughs> demo. <laughs> and uh, so we did, and we played, and we played, and we played, and we played, and we basically visited all the record companies. And nobody uh, really heard anything uh, interesting. And it was all the Siobhan's and a lot of, song of the hits on that demo. Um, Eventually, uh, we uh, were picked up by, uh, it's actually two stores in one year, which is interesting, but we were picked up by a Swedish uh, a label called Telegram. But at that time, we already gave up the idea with the Swedish record company. So we started to send um, the tapes to a Danish record company who had a lot of interesting bands um, uh, that we, we really liked. They had KLF, they had uh, Tektotronic, they had Rosanna. They had um, a lot of uh, electro, uh, electronic music bands. And, um, uh, and they basically called us up many months after they got the tape because they were, uh, I, don't, I don't know, they were busy with others or they lost the tape or whatever. But they found the tape eventually, thank God. And they played it and they were like, wow, where's the number to these guys? And so they called up uh, and I got a call from, from, one of the, from, from the head of a and and said, don't sign with anyone. We understand the music, even though it was weird because we played like reggae, we played house, we played electro, we played, we were all over the, uh, the place. And, and that was one of the challenges for record companies because, you know, in all record stores, you were placed by, by a genre. So it was pop music here, A to Z, uh, rock music, A to Z, hip hop, Z. But we were, all all around the place. We didn't even know where to put our records in in a record store, and they thought it was this going to be very difficult to market us because what are we? We are a band with a lot of songs, and every song is different. Um, and um, 
So this um, uh, guy from Telegram, he, uh, after we got this call from the Danes, he said, uh, uh, and we had an honest discussion with him because we knew he, he didn't really know how to market us. Mm -hmm. And uh, we said, Klaus, I'm sorry, but I, I don't think our collaboration will work. And we, we had signed like a four album contract with him and recorded the first single uh, called Wheel of Fortune with him. Mm -hmm. In Stockholm, that was a big moment. First time we worked in Stockholm with real producers. Um, and uh, we said, uh, we're willing to buy, uh, buy back the, the demo if we get back the contract. So basically, we bought back the, the demo for $2,000 because that was the cost of the studio time. Mm -hmm. And we um, and gave it to Mega Records. And uh, so basically, Mega Records bought us and the contract for $2,000 from Telegram. So it Which sounds is, like they uh, got a pretty good deal there. <laughs> the, yeah, uh, and the, the, the head of Telegram, he became worldwide famous for being the man who sold LaserBase for $2,000. I think it's, it's a little bit unfair because he's actually a very nice guy and had done a lot of good things, but he's now famed. That's what he's most famous for. <laughs> Poor guy. <laughs> All right. Well, uh, you mentioned earlier too. You talked about the the reunion uh, in the the mid two thousands. Uh, so I was curious a little bit about that. Um, what was that like compared to your time with Ace of Base in the in the nineties? Yeah. So uh, last album we released was like two thousand with mm -hmm. with with the uh, with the band. At that time, uh, Marlin. Um, uh, she already were really tired of 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 uh, being a the pop star agent and to be honest she was tired from day one she never wanted to be a rock star or pop star uh she wanted to sing she loved music and this whole uh show business didn't fit her at all mm -hmm. on top of that she was afraid of flying and she has a lot of integrity and uh, of course sitting there with journalists day in and day out asking you questions most of them very shallow, very easy, mm -hmm. but uh, longer, deeper discussion, uh, interviews actually can get, you know, quite emotional. And she really, 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 really did not like it. And uh, she didn't feel well doing it either. She felt empty. She was sad. She was quite depressed over that time. So she actually wanted to leave the band already in 93 before we even hit America. Uh, but we kept her in the band. Uh, we succeeded to convince her to stay. And uh, but when we and you can see that on the albums and also in the videos that we are already from the second album started to fade Marlin out from the band more and more. Mm -hmm. She was singing less and less. You see her less and less in the videos. You see her less and less in uh, in photos, in uh, in articles, and so forth. On the third album, you barely see her at all on the on the front on the on the on the cover of the album, and uh, and the same thing with the fourth album. Um, uh, so when we stopped two thousand one, uh, it was for several different reasons. First of all, Marlene didn't want to do it anymore at all. She, she said this is the last album, uh, but also uh, for us, we've been non-stop working with this for uh well jonas and i have been working with this for 14 15 15, well, it was 15 years mm -hmm. every day um and of course when you, you meet somebody you work with someone 24 7 uh, for 15 years it gets you, you get on each other's nerves even if you want it or not and they also siblings you know so they they had the you know the typical sibling small fights all the time as all siblings have uh, so it kind of it was quite natural for us to we didn't have the energy and you can hear our last album was was not a very good album uh, I think we maybe had two good songs on it, it you can feel in the in in, uh, in the songs that the energy is lost the soul is lost we are tired of the business we are tired of music and we just needed a break. And we didn't have one break at all. So you understand our first four years in the studio, then directly success, and then non-stop on the tour, on the promotion tour. The first promotion tour lasted for two and a half years without being home one day. So um, we needed a break, and so it came very natural when she said, stop, we stop. Also, um, 
I think you know, ra uh, world radio was quite tired of pop music also at that time because at that time, a lot of bands, American bands, also had started to work with Swedish producers and Swedish songwriters like Max Martin and Dennis Pop. Uh, the whole Sherion uh, studio and and everything started to sound very Swedish pop, which actually we started in the early 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 nineties. And I think radio just got very tired of it, and not only radio, probably the listeners too. So I think it was a good time for us to just leave, uh, not leave Earth, but leave the uh, public uh, um, eye for a while. Um, and uh, then we did have time to do a lot of other things. And I, 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 I did a lot of other things uh, while I did Ace Base. Uh, I, did, I did a few tech, uh, tech companies, uh, media companies, and so forth. So I, I kept myself very busy on all different uh, uh, angles. But uh, when this stopped, I could focus on my other uh, projects. And um, after a while, you get a little bit... Mm, should we do a comeback or not? And everybody's asking, of course, for when, when you're going to do a comeback. At that time, in the beginning, like 2002, 2003, I never thought we would do a comeback because I was still extremely tired of the, of the showbiz. Uh, but um, um, we, uh, uh, we decided in 2006 to give it, give it a shot uh, without Marlin, just with Jenny. And um, we recorded some songs that were not good enough. Um, we didn't really have, have the energy yet for, to do, start writing songs again. But we started to tour. To tour. We did two world tours, uh, two great world tours. We had a lot of fun. And, um, and uh, we, um, uh, uh, we were um, uh, around the world uh, a couple of times. Uh, and. Uh, we decided to uh, to do uh, an album. Unfortunately, when we were really doing an album, we were, Jonas and I was were in the studio for one year. Jenny decided to do solo career instead. instead. So um, uh, we and then we had not just lost one girl; we actually had lost two girls. And uh, so we had to recruit two new girls for the band. Uh, I think recruiting one new girl would have worked. Two new girls is quite a quite a big change on the band with only four members. Mm -hmm. um, so, um, uh, and then it was kind of a little bit different times in, in, the, in the record industry. They had barely recovered from Napster. Uh, they have not learned anything about internet yet. Interesting enough, 2010. Uh, and uh, me working with internet uh, and been working with internet since the mid 90s, I was quite shocked actually how behind the whole record industry were in, in thinking digital. Um, and uh, we had a lot of arguments with the record companies how to release and how to do this, how to do that. And in the end, we just did a very traditional release, which I, I did not agree at all on doing, but, and it didn't run, did, did not really work out that well. But we did another tour with the two new girls worked out actually really well. And our last concert was, was in, uh, in Poland on uh, 2010 on New Year's Eve in Wrocław. And uh, we were expecting 100,000 people, but actually 200,000 people showed up. And that's our biggest concert ever, uh, a li live audience um, ever. And, uh, so that was quite great to finish off the, the last uh, tour with, with, a, with, a, with, a, with a record of, of most, uh, the biggest audience. Um, and then we have put everything on the side. Of course, we have had discussions to do something uh, for this 30th anniversary. Um, and uh, we had a few ideas. Um, we are releasing this uh, uh, box with a lot of unreleased <laughs> materials. Uh, but of course, COVID have uh, kind of put everything upside down. Um, we have a lot of different uh, things we can celebrate. Uh, first, number one in America, first this, first that. So we still have a few anniversaries we can do things at. Uh, I just need my band to uh, be as um, enthusiastic about it as I am. Because I would love to go out touring. I love it. I love to be on stage, jumping around, see the audience and, you know, and, and, uh, and, 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 uh, and meet the fans. 
Um, but uh, I need to convince the other ones that it's as funny. <laughs> <laughs> so let's see. I, it might happen. It might not happen. Let's see what's, where, where, the, where the world is going now. But um, I, am, I, I'm, I do work t- two hours a day with, with the band and with the re- Ace of Base related uh, uh, things. Uh, some are very boring uh, lawyer stuff and something are very, very funny uh, collaborations with other artists. Uh, which is great. We just had a German band. Uh, I think actually they became number one with uh, Ola Schwanz, but in uh, it's a very hardcore hip hop version in German. Um, this is the new uh, remix that came out this summer, I think. Correct? Yeah, yeah. I, I, th- I th- no, I think it was released this spring, um, and uh, then it became a big hit. And I see it now on my uh, on the. It's very funny. You can. You can see where it's played with all these digital, you know, mm-hmm. tools you have, and also you can see how much you know revenues it, it, it gets you because we are the songwriters of the song, um, uh, and it's uh, and Germany is a big market. It's Germany and it's Austria and it's Switzerland. That's funny when, when people can take a song which is so poppy and, and nice and, and innocent as all the Shawans and completely change it to uh, become a very aggressive, uh, very hardcore song, but with almost the same lyrics. They've changed the lyrics a little bit. And of course, German language is quite hard in itself. But I love the version. I think it's great. So I, I love all these new remixes and covers and new versions that are coming out. Uh, I think it's good, great. Oh, and I'm curious, you mentioned uh, back in like the, the early 2010s that the music industry industry still hadn't really grasped the internet and kind of the potential it had for music. So as someone who's is a businessman as well as, as worked uh, creatively in the music industry, I'm curious uh, because I know you guys have some things coming out on streaming services. Uh, I think the Hidden Gems 2 is coming out next week. On, on streaming services. So from your perspective, how has that kind of changed the game when it comes to music? Um, well, it changed everything because if I look uh, back in the 90s and look back uh, on the big markets like Russia, South America, Africa, China, India, now basically covered 80% of the planet, correct? Mm-hmm we've seen exactly zero revenues from these countries. <laughs> uh, Mexico, um, of course the US and Europe is, is great in Japan and South Korea and, and Canada, but that's it basically. That's the only, and Australia of course. Uh, nobody, oh, and Israel, but that's a very small country. Um, the rest of the world had never paid anything uh, because it's always pirate company, but now they actually getting the streaming services there, and and you can see how the reach is ha- it has in all these countries. Uh, having companies like Tencent, uh, first of all, they invested in Spotify. Spotify is a Swedish company, the first actually Decathlon uh, from Europe. Uh, uh, very proud of my Swedish fellow entrepreneurs. <laughs> um, uh, because they're doing great thing. Uh, I know. I know everybody complaining that they don't pay very much, but actually they pay seventy percent. Uh, it's the record companies who doesn't pay. So uh, I think uh, it's very important for for every consumer to understand it's not Spotify's fault that the record companies is not paying the artists better than they do. But that's a different a different story. <laughs> um, so um, uh, with streaming, um, uh, it it really reaches. The, the whole world and it's just starting and if you look at Tencent they invested in Spotify they own uh, 10% of Spotify and Spotify invested in Tencent Music uh, they own 10% of Tencent Music and Tencent have 800 million clients that's quite a lot yeah. of people and they started to pay now they started to pay for the service so it's 
when countries like China and India, this, this is like almost 3 billion people in these two countries, um, started to pay, even though it's micropayments, it's going to be a lot of money. And it's important for, for I think, for, for the growth of the music industry that it, it is an economical, um, sustainable business model worldwide. Um, and um, so I love, the, I love the streaming services, even though you, obviously you, for one stream you get, you know, basically almost nothing, but you have to get up to the millions and millions and millions to see any money. Um, but it is, I think it's um, special for bands. Okay, now bands can tour. Um, and that's, it's been a tough, very tough time for active musicians these days. Yeah. Um, especially the ones who are not, you know, they don't have too many songs played on radio or, or, or streaming, not enough for them to pay the bills. Mm -hmm. And they always been touring. They read a song, but they depend, they're not depending on their revenues from there. They're depending on the revenues from touring. And now is that they, they haven't been able to tour since the uh, beginning of, of February. And of course, summer is the biggest time to tour. So it's been very tough for, for, for most artists. They have a very, 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 very tough time right now. In Sweden, we try to help them with, uh, with, uh, with support, of course, but uh, it's, it's never enough. I'm not sure how it works in the US. I know you have enormous packages to rescue entrepreneurs, but I'm not sure if it reaches the, the musicians um, or who it reaches, reaches <laughs> at all. But the numbers are enormous, trillions and trillions and trillions. Mm -hmm. um, and hopefully it helps. Uh, and hopefully this COVID time will not last forever. And uh, maybe hopefully next year we will see uh, bands tour again and so forth. That's what I hope at least. I was thinking of one other thing that I was curious about. I saw you were, you experienced the tsunami in 2004? Yeah. What was, I'm very curious about that. Where, where exactly were you? Were you somewhere you could see it and had to evacuate? So we landed in the morning, the same day, and we were on the way to the, to the hotel. And the hotel was on Serene Beach. Serene Beach was uh, pretty heavily damaged um, on Phuket. And it was the first trip with my first son, my, my first child which is his son. He was three months old. And um, it was a pretty, I mean, it was very hard because you didn't understand what, what, what happened because it was on the beach and, and the hotel was, it was kind of on the beach, but it was a little bit higher up. So it, yeah, it, the wave, none of the waves hit the hotel. So we just started to hear about weird things and somebody had seen a bus in the tree and, what, what have happened and it's been and my my friend who owns the hotel he has been jogging on the beach just just basically five minutes the, the tsunami hit and he just came back and i don't know i haven't seen anything and nobody heard anything and um then then we started to we took a car we drive we drove around and we started to see the damage and wow that was a very shocking uh the first you know it was people still hanging from the trees and People cut in half and a lot of people in the water. And the worst thing was that, I mean, the first wave came and hit and very few people knew what a tsunami was. So then it, it actually re, uh, redraw and suddenly there was no water. I mean, because it's very shallow in many of these places. So suddenly you had, you had beaches were miles long and fishes everywhere jumping up and down so people they they didn't understand they said, okay the water is gone wow and there's a lot of fishes so a lot of people started to walk out on the the beach mm -hmm. but it was not the beach that was obviously the the uh, the bottom of the ocean and then the second wave came which was even bigger but that that second wave had a lot of rubble with it because the first wave came brought a lot of houses with it and all the materials from houses glass and and uh, steel and all that stuff so the second wave when it came it was like razor blades and it cut all the people in pieces and that was a really really risk and then the third wave came it was, it was not as big as a, as the third wave so to see these people i mean um, it, 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 was, um, it was one of the most dramatic uh, um, uh, experiences. So then I had to make a decision. 
should we should we just leave? Is our first kid is here? Are, are we safe? I spoke to some doctors. The most important thing when um, um, uh, accidents like this happen and uh, natural cat catastrophes happen is that the groundwater has to be um, uh, clean. So you don't get because you can get really sick. I mean, you can die from the water if it, a lot of dead bodies are around or whatever. They can, bacteria are very dangerous. So first thing we put up was, uh, you know, we testing the water everywhere so we didn't have infected water. And then I, I just realized that my, my friend, he owns three hotels in the area. And uh, we can do a lot of help here because we, we um, and unfortunately, Sweden was, we, have, we were a little bit unlucky because we, our foreign minister had just been murdered. And um, the new foreign minister was definitely not suited for, for, for the job. She should have known that the most, the place where most Swedes are during Christmas is in Thailand and the island Phuket. She never heard about Phuket. So she was watching, uh, you know, she was at the cinema. She got a note on her phone, there's a tsunami. She didn't know what the tsunami was and she didn't know what Phuket was. So she continued to watch her movie and so forth. It took basically Sweden, we normally very efficient, very fast people, but it took it three days for us to react because it was so overwhelming how many people were, were missing. At that time it was like, I mean, we had hundreds of thousands of people uh, missing for a while. So, I mean, it was almost like we were frozen of, of because it was so big, so drama traumatic. So we, we, nobody reacted. So we, we said we had to do something. So we rented three planes, filled it with doctors and, and priests and all that stuff, flew it down to Phuket. And then we filled it up with passengers from the hotels and flew them back. And we flew back and forth, back and forth. And then we, uh, we uh, um, uh, refurbished one of the hotels to uh, to a hospital, one to a child um, uh, home, because a lot of children lost their parents. Um, local uh, Thai, may, but also, not only Thai, but a lot of Thai people lost their parents, but also a lot of um, tourists lost their, uh, um, the, the kids lost their parents. So we filled it with kids. And then uh, when the uh, uh, doctors and, uh, and nurses and also psychologists came down, they said one very important thing for a child uh, when you're going through a trauma like this is actually to have something to play with. But um, obviously everything was broken on the, on, 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 on the, on the, on the beach. Uh, but the fun that we could do, do partly with, there was a big shopping center, not far away. So we could take a car, go to the shopping center, buy a lot of equipment like, uh, what was needed for that time with credit cards and then go back, which was <laughs> very, um, um, uh, it was a, a weird, weird situation. Then, then all, of course, all the toys were, they were gone after one hour. So then I realized I have friends in China with toy factories. So um, they send us three containers with toys and we can give them to the kids, not only in Phuket, but also in other places in, in, in Thailand. And then it, went on from there and we decided to actually stay and help and I um, made sure my son didn't leave the hotel, it was a very good hotel and, and of course we were smashing the water but I stayed there seven weeks and helped out with the rescue um, uh, uh, help there uh, and it was a lot of, um, lot of uh, memories there with it, which, which um, I will never forget, that's for sure. Well, I, was, I was curious about that, that story, that's, that's crazy. Yeah, it, it was it was very crazy. Uh, there's a lot of heroes in this. A uh, lot of people who helped out, and a lot of people who saved lives. And I was ama it's amazing sometimes how traumas like this can really bring people together in a in a great way. I mean, you see that you have a lot of you know volcanoes and tornadoes and and stuff in and uh, and hurricanes, of course, and and uh, and uh, earthquakes and and, and fires uh, in the U.S. We don't have that much of that in Sweden, you know, so we're not used to natural cat catastrophes. We actually don't have cat natural catastrophes here at all, you know. So um, this was very different from for, for, for every aspect. I appreciate you taking the time to, to sit down and talk. Uh, it's been a lot of fun to, to chat. 
Thank you very much. Great yeah. to be on the show. Awesome. That's Ulf Ekberg of Ace of Bass here on Open Mic. <laughs>